Right. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, we are going to wait just a few more minutes to let people um, come on in and then we'll get started. Um, just hang tight. Um, but thank you so much for joining us. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we are the Master of Science in Anesthesia program at Case Western Reserve University. And I'm gonna go over the agenda um, for today. So just so you have a quick overview of what we'll um, go over. So we are gonna go over the profession overview first, and then we'll hit on the programs. Um, so we actually have three different locations that we will um, tell you about. We have Cleveland, Washington, DC, and Houston. Um, we have two of our students with us tonight and they'll speak on their student experience. We'll wrap up with the application process. And then from there, um, we will end with a Q&A section. So from there, I just wanna take care of one housekeeping item. Um, feel free to use the Q&A um, portion of the feature at the bottom of the screen. So over to, it's about four items over. Um, you can click on the Q&A. If a question pops up while we're talking, feel free to chat it. Um, and our students, as well as our um, program directors will be able to answer those. Um, and if we don't get to your question uh, during our Q&A section, then feel free to email us. I will provide the email at the end where you can reach us. Um, so from here, I'm going to introduce our panelists. I'm Logan. I'll be your host tonight. We have Shane, um, who is the Associate uh, Executive Program Director and Program Director of Washington, D.C. We have Ken, who is the Program Director of Houston. We have Chris with us tonight, who is um, our second year student at our Cleveland location. And we have Cassandra with us as well, who is a second year student at our Houston um, location. So without further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Shane, who's gonna give you an overview of the profession. Great, thank you so much, Logan. And uh, good evening, everybody. So I'm gonna start off a little bit with a pretty straightforward question, but uh, it actually gets pretty complicated the more you uh, dig into it. What is a certified anesthesiologist? Well, to put it simple, that's what I am. I, I am a certified anesthesiologist assistant. That's what I practice. And as, as a, that title um, may uh, you know, designate, it's also referred to as an advanced practice professional. There are a variety of people that do hold that title of the advanced practice professionals. Those could include PAs as well as many other nurse practitioners in those fields. So under that umbrella uh, within our particular uh, domain is anesthesia. And we are specialized and with extensive training in the delivery of anesthesia care. And we work um, in an anesthesia care team model. We work as a team, which is a fantastic way to work, especially in healthcare. Healthcare being team oriented toward a singular person who's a member of that team, and that's the patient. 
So what do we do? Well, we work in collaboration and helping develop and implement anesthesia care plans. And those plans start from even before the patients come in to when they come into the hospitals or the surgery centers, the procedures clinics, through their procedure or their surgery and out through recovery and on their way home. We wanna care for them through the continuum of that process. We are importantly uh, certified and uh, hence the certified component of our title. We are certified by the NCCAA, which itself is administered through the National Board of Medical Examiners. And that's an important caveat there. That is the same national board that um, uh, certifies and the step one and step two uh, for physicians in medical school. So it's a very high bar and we're really proud to have that collaboration with that group. The next, um, portion that we can talk a little bit about is where do we practice? Well, I've happened to practice in Washington, DC, but I've also practiced in many other states across the country. Currently we have 18 jurisdictions and growing. Uh, I'm very privileged um, and to serve as the chair of the AAA EP, which oversees all the programs nationwide. And I can tell you from my discussions and work with that organization that many deans and schools of medicines in many states are actively um, pursuing where and when they can put in programs of their own. So these numbers will go up as they have gone over the years. Um, importantly too, we are recognized by the Veterans Administration and uh, of course the CMS, which is a key federal indicator for recognizing professions and reimbursing for their services. Um, another really important point I think uh, regarding our students is our graduates and what do they end up doing? I gotta tell you, they are incredibly in high demand. Just today, I received yet another um, group looking to hire and bring people on. I have to tell them, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but all of our pending graduates have jobs. Um, we have a very few of them who don't have jobs at the moment, but they're waiting until their board exam in February before taking the next step. So um, they're in high demand. And I think a lot of that is because of the training they receive and it's become quite uh, well known, the work that the students have put in to uh, develop the skills they have. The graduates are highly pursued by employers across the, the country in those jurisdictions. We have very high job placement rates because of that and very high uh, passage rates on the national board exam. It's a pretty desirable um, work environment. Uh, the average salaries for our graduates are around 160. And of course this ranges, some a little bit higher, uh, higher, some a little bit lower, but in it overall, it's around that range. That uh, doesn't necessarily include any of the overtime or mood lighting that might pick up. In addition to this uh, pretty flexible 40 hour work week, um, there's a call options that people might take and pick up. Depends upon the hospital that they're at, the work environment. Clearly, if you're at a level one trauma hospital, you're gonna be taking call and taking care of traumas and some really sick patients. Um, in addition to that, um, that hard work that people put in to care for the patients, they get a decent amount of time off and it's well-earned and that varies between four to six weeks of time off. We're really proud to be where we are with Case Western Reserve as a 25 ranked, uh, top 25 ranked uh, school of medicine in the country. They just do a fantastic job of making sure we have all the resources we need and are real, real, feel real privileged to be part of that organization. We have programs here in um, Washington, D.C. and in Cleveland and in Houston and very soon in Austin, Texas. We're proud about the new program that will be coming under us in the near, in near future. Our program is 24 months. Pretty remarkable um, feat that we're able to achieve here. We've been doing this for a long time. One of the reasons uh, for the program length is that we have a high benchmark for our applicants. Our applicants have to meet a lot of pre-requirements that are not necessarily required for some of the other programs. So we're real proud of that. And that leads to an early entry. And this is really important. It leads to an early hands-on clinical training. Our students are with patients, working by their sides, working with their clinical instructors in an early setting. What's so great about this is that they start that experience early and in, in conjunction with their didactic training, it really starts to coalesce everything that people are doing. A lot of people might say this, well, I'm a hands-on learner. Well, this is exactly what we do here. We bridge that, of course, with a heavy didactic component as well. So we really are nurturing both aspects of the learning modules. Our programs are all independently accredited by CAHEB, which is the Commission on Accreditation for Allied Health Education Programs. And so uh, what unique thing is that each one of these unique uh, accreditations have their own accomplishments need to be met independently. So we're real proud of having those uh, reliances. Um, sort of the unique aspect of our program, if you will, beyond that is uh, the fact that we've been doing this a very long time. We're one of the founding programs of the profession. We've been doing this for over 50 years. Our graduates um, come in <laughs> uh, real strong and go out real strong. 
like I said, they're very highly sought after. Uh, many of them are getting their job offers as, as it is in the fall semester right now. The clinical training, this is a really important part of our, of our curriculum. The clinical training, what we track is we track the student's clinical time at the hospital, but also importantly, the clinical time they're with patients side by side. So this is a really important benchmark that we're tracking specifically is that clinical contact time. We think this is really important because that's the time that people are doing anesthesia, not necessarily in the lounge, uh, looking at patient charts and doing other activities, which are important, but the other important component is the direct uh, hands-on clinical training. We do training in all the specialties as well as regional anesthesia to based upon where people might practice and train. And we're really proud because of our long history, we have over 80 different hospital affiliations that we work with. So pretty cool to be um, in this organization and have these opportunities for our students to rotate in all these different locations. Speaking of our student rotations, um, we have a lots of specialty rotations that are absolutely required part of the clinical training. And these include ambulatory, right? These are patients that come in and go home the same day. Cardiac, people coming in for cardiac procedures, whether they be heavily invasive, minor invasive cardiac procedures, nerve blocks, neurosurgery, whether it be um, on, on one's back perhaps and their vertebrae or intracranial, obstetrics and deliveries, the intensive care unit, uh, pediatrics and trauma. Um, I do wanna highlight a couple of things now clearly because of COVID, some of these are very um, uh, important areas of the hospital right now and how we're managing the pandemic. So a lot of our graduates and our students are doing in these areas are absolutely contributing to the um, necessity of recovery through this pandemic. So um, great, unique learning experiences that all of our students are having right now. And with that, Logan, I think I'll take a pause, yeah? Yes, thank you. Um, we're gonna jump right into um, our location and our sites. So first up is Cleveland. Um, we have 27 seats. Um, we're actually located on Case Western Reserve's main campus. Um, so our staff and faculty offices, as well as our classrooms, are located in the School of Medicine. Um, the campus is right in the heart of University Circle. So we're very fortunate and very lucky to have um, a few different medical hospital systems right in our backyard. Um, so right beside Case Western Reserve University is University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center. It's literally steps away, you can walk there. A few blocks down is Cleveland Clinic. And then from there, um, a couple ways away is the VA Hospital. And then we also have access to Metro Health which is um, a little bit closer to downtown, maybe like 10, 15 minutes away. Still very easy um, access. So students not only have easy access to these hospitals, but they do their clinical rotations there as well. Um, and the hospitals listed Cleveland Clinic, University Hospitals and Metro Health um, have several different um, sites affiliated with them. So in their first and second years, our students get to um, rotate at these locations. Um, and a little bit about the uh about University Circle. Um, so it's located four miles from downtown, which has all the sporting events, um, lots of things to do downtown. But right um, on Case Western's um, campus, right beside it is um, a cultural hub. So we have access to um, like steps away are all the museums. So we have the Cleveland Museum of Art, the History Museum, Cleveland Bo Botanical Gardens, and, and these are all free to students. Um, we have Severin's Hall, uh, which the Cleveland Orchestra gets um, has the opportunity to play there. So um, they're actually top five in the world, which is something to note. Not a lot of people know that. Um, and then we also have Wade, our Wade Oval Circle, which is a great place to take a break. Um, when the weather permits, you can take a walk there. And then in the summertime, um, there is Wade Oval Wednesday. So it's a great opportunity. It's like a big festival um, to experience all of the Cleveland food as well as concerts, music. So lots going on here, very lively. Um, but that's a little bit about our Cleveland location. Um, moving right into Houston, um, Texas. So there's 28 seats here. Um, Texas is located near the Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center, which is the largest medical complex in the world. It steps away from nearby parks. Um, great place to be. I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Cassandra because she is um, one of our students there. Um, Cassandra, can you highlight a little bit about your rotations there and what you like about um, living in Houston and things like that? Yes, so we are currently training our main hospital is Memorial Hermann Texas Medical Center, but we also have availability at different hospitals nearby. 
Um, we have Texas Heart Institute, which is where a lot of us do our cardiac rotation, or you can do your cardiac rotation in Memorial Hermit. We can do our PD rotation um, also in Memorial Hermit. We are also rotating out to different surgical centers like um, an orthopedic spine um, surgical center. And yeah, we have a lot of different hospitals that we are able to rotate nearby. We have one in Sugarland, which is a little further out from Maine, Houston. Um, and you also see different patient populations. Usually at Memorial Hermann, um, it's more of a level one trauma hospital. So you see patients who obviously um, either come in with traumas um, from life flight or they are a little more high risk just because of the type of diseases and comorbidities that they have. But then when you go out to other hospitals and you rotate to other hospitals like um, Sugarland or maybe patients, um, these patients tend to be a little healthier. So you get really a lot of experience managing different types of patients so that by the time you graduate from the program, you truly have a, um, a uh, good understanding of the type of anesthesia and management that you have to perform for different types of patients. Um, in addition, uh, the campus itself is very, very close to um, the hospital where we train. And um, there's also a metro that you can ride um, to and from the hospital, from, from campus to hospital. It's very close. Um, the ride's probably like 10 minutes if at that um, tops. And yeah, it's great. Um, there's a lot of, we have the, across from our main training hospital, which is um, Memorial Hermann, we have uh, the Houston Zoo and it's really located in the heart of Texas. Um, we're very proud of the Texas Medical Center. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely a great place to train. Um, you get a lot of hands-on training and um, very, very diverse. And the food is great, by the way, guys. Thank you so much, Cassandra. I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Shane, who's the program director of the RDC location. Wonderful. Thank you, Cassandra and Logan. Yeah, so Washington, DC, we have uh, 30 seats currently at our location. We are located in uh, what's admirably called the Noma District, or north of Massachusetts. Um, if you've ever been to Washington, D.C., Massachusetts is one of the major thoroughfares and major artery in the city that kind of goes across uh, from the north, uh, northwest to the uh, southeast. And um, great thoroughfare to be a part of. It's also right next to Union Station, which is just one of those classic, typical, beautiful old Union Stations uh, that you can take the train up to New York or Boston or Philadelphia. Um, it's also where the metro is. Uh, most people in D.C. commute by public transportation and the trains or the buses or by the um, local commute, which is a lot of bikes and, uh, and scooters are very common in our area, uh, being an urban setting and whatnot. Our um, clinical affiliates are fantastic. We are just very proud of them. Our MedStar is one of our primary ones, and that stands for Medical Shock Trauma Air Rescue. And uh, the primary one is Washington Hospital Center, often referred to as WHC or the center. And um, it's about a thousand bed hospital, and uh, we take every kind of case you can possibly imagine. It's an incredibly busy uh, patient um, uh, illness uh, variety and a uh, great place to, to practice and train and learn. Um, our other affiliates are uh, Georgetown University Hospital and George Washington University Hospital. We have our first years and our second year students and our graduates going to these locations. Very uh, storied histories for both of those um, academic institutions and their anesthesia departments. So fantastic opportunities for the students to learn in those different environments um, while still being in Washington, DC. And of course, too, we have the nation's pediatric hospital or Children's National Medical Center, which is just steps away from Washington Hospital Center. All of this is quite um, accessible for the students or the faculty with uh, the train system, as well as other you know, means that people often use. It's very common for a few people to jump into an Uber for five minutes and share a dollar or so each and get to A to B. 
Um, within that area, we are also located steps away from Capitol Hill, the National Mall, just wonderful museums here that are all free. Um, thank you for those of you paying your taxes. That makes all of the museums uh, free here in Washington, DC, all the Smithsonian's. Uh, of course, we uh, definitely take advantage of all of them because they're, they're just amazing. Great history of our, of our country. Um, other things that are um, of note here too uh, that I have to hit on, DC is a college town. A lot of people um, you know, don't always remember that. And um, uh, you know, of course, there's a politics that do take on uh, here, but also, as I mentioned, those two universities, Georgetown and George Washington. Well, there's those also Johns Hopkins, right? There's also the University of Maryland. There's also American University. There's also Howard University. There's also Gallaudet University. And the list goes on and on. So it's very much a college town. It's very much a young town. And the group here is basically made up of people who uh, want to do something with their academic or their professional life. And usually the people are in their 20s and 30s. And they're here to make a difference. And they're here to make an impact or do a fellowship and then go on with their life and experiences. So it's a great young town, very diverse in uh, cuisine as well. Um, we absolutely have every country represented here um, because of the uh, ambassadors and embassies we have here. Um, I'll even tell you that we do have some North Koreans here as well <laughs> who uh, don't have a, uh, an embassy, but they are represented. So great um, variety of cuisine and cultures here. So it's really fun for us to be a part of it. Um, with that, I'll pause and, and I'll let Logan and the rest of the team take over. Thank you, Shane. I'm going to go ahead and jump to the next slide. Um, we're going to hear from Chris, um, who's going to tell us a little bit about his student experience, how he found the field um, and the profession, how what made him choose um, Case Western. Thank you, Logan, for the introduction. Um, again, my name is Chris. I'm currently a second year student at our Cleveland, Ohio location. I'm originally from Cleveland, so it actually worked out perfect uh, to stay here in the area. Uh, but I do know a lot of students that, that come from all over and it's, it's actually just a nice experience for them to, you know, travel to another state and, and complete the program there and experience a different, um, different state city. Um, now I, I remember, you know, being at this stage before I applied, uh, just being a prospective student and even after being accepted to the program, um, and I remember some of the more common questions that I and as well as many other students had at this point. Um, and what I wanted to do today is <clears throat> just address some of those questions and hopefully give everyone a little more insight from a, a student perspective. Uh, me personally, I, I used to work in uh, research at Case Western Reserve University. And a friend of mine that I graduated from uh, undergrad with, went through the program and is practicing as an anesthesiologist assistant at University Hospitals, which is um, one of the largest hospitals in, in the Cleveland area. And, you know, I, I had never even heard of this program until I, I ran into her one day in the hospital and she told me about it. And as soon as I got a chance to shadow her, I was... Uh, I was just hooked. It's just such an amazing, amazing program. It's an amazing field. Um, and you know, that, that kind of brings me to one of the most, you know, common questions, which is why become an anesthesiologist assistant? And, you know, I, I think Shane, you know, talked plenty about, um, you know, this, this career choice and all the, the perks of it um, at the beginning of this presentation. And just to, again, to reiterate it, it's, you just have a, a great work-life balance. Um, I mean, it's a two-year program. Uh, again, great compensation. Um, and you just enjoy working in the anesthesia care team model. And it's, it is astonishing how much autonomy uh, we get as, um, you know, advanced practice providers. You know, most people think, oh, well, anesthesiologist assistant, you're not probably doing that much. It's complete opposite. It's, um, I, I know, unfortunately, with COVID, many of you have not had a chance to, to shadow um, an AA and kind of get a feel for it, but I can assure you, it, you would be 
utterly amazed at um, the amount of autonomy you get. And it's just because of how well uh, we're trained uh, in this field. Um, next would be, why did I myself choose Case Western and why should prospective students choose Case Western? I would say first and foremost, uh, no other program gets you into clinicals as early as Case does. And this is such a major benefit um, of this program. And you know that's not a knock on other programs. It's just, this is where Case kind of uh, stands out. That early immersion into the, to the clinical setting, um, it just helps so much with uh, you know, your continuing education as you go through the program. And again, that also shortens our program to a 24 month program. Um, compared to, you know, other programs that are, I believe, you know, around the 27, 28 months uh, long. Uh, so that's, that's a huge benefit um, through CASE, among others, of course, you know, I could get into many other benefits of CASE, um, but uh, for the sake of time, um, I'll just jump into, you know, one of, one of the other questions that a lot of prospective students have and that I get asked all the time is what's the typical schedule like uh, during your first and second year of the program? And all I can say is it's busy, um, very busy, but it's it's a good busy. Uh, you know, your first year is gonna be the busiest of the program. Uh, you're bouncing between didactic courses and clinicals, which is great because you're actually applying things you learn in class to the clinical setting. I, I can't tell you how many times um, you know, I have been in class and we've been learning about something and I go into clinical the next day and actually have a case just like what we talked about. And just being able to apply that knowledge you learn, it's just such a rewarding feeling. Um, and then, you know, exams your first year, you, of course, you know, we're all, we all went through undergrad. We know, um, how stressful exams can be. Um, but this is kind of where you learn how to find a balance in, in this busy schedule. And it's important to find that balance. Um, you know, everybody, you're going to hear time and time again, and I, I will say it till I'm blue in the face that this is a very rigorous, intense program. It's a very hard program. You're going to hear that a lot, but it's, it's doable. Um, that being said, you still have time for a social life. Uh, you still have time on the weekends to go out with friends. Um, and, you know, during your first year, since we have such smaller class sizes, uh, you get really close to your classmates and it's, it's great. I, everybody leans on each other and you just kind of become like a family. You spend so much time together uh, throughout the week. It's, um, it's nice to be able to hang out on the weekend and just kind of, you know, decompress after a long week, which is super important for mental health um, and not getting bogged down. But again, you have um, plenty of people, resources there to, to help you. Um, you know, one thing that we do, which is one of the greatest things um, is every first year gets paired with a second year uh, mentor. So you, you kind of have a second year upper class mate um, to kind of reach out to and, um, you know, ask questions. And, you know, we make it a big point to always be available for our mentees to, to reach out to us and answer questions that they may be having. So it's just kind of all around 360, you have such a great support uh, network. Um, and that will really help you get through that first year um, of this program. And then that takes you into your second year. And second year is, um, it's so much fun. Uh, it's clinicals basically five days a week. Um, this is where you're doing your specialty rotations. Uh, and, and this is um, where you really get to per put everything that you've learned during your first year to use. And it's, uh, again, it's a very rewarding feeling because you're starting to, you know, kind of get the flow of, of how the OR works and you're learning more and more about anesthesia. 
and um, you just gain a lot more confidence in, in what you're doing. And it just, um, it's just a, a, a good time in, in second year. Again, you still have your, your rough weeks um, and your tough rotations, but you know, I always tell everybody, if you can get through first year, you can second year's a breeze. Um, and this is also where we have an opportunity to um, do external clinical rotations. Um, you know, CASE is affiliated with so many hospitals across the country. And uh, we really do have a lot of opportunities to, um, you know, do a clinical rotation at, an, at a hospital that's out of state. You know, if it's somewhere, you know, back home or somewhere that you're interested in working, uh, you know, the program is, is great about setting up, um, you know, these external clinical rotations where they're able to. Um, and then other than that, you're just studying for boards like myself and I'm sure Cassandra is studying hard as well. Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but again, even in your second year, you still have time for a social life. This isn't, you know, two years straight book study and clinicals and you never see the light of day. Um, you, you learn to kind of adapt to the schedule and um, really get a chance to take advantage of weekends. So it's, it's great. And the last thing I'll say is remember, this is a 24 month program, uh, which is such a huge advantage over other programs. You know, we get out into the workforce earlier um, and it just, it, it's, it's a big name for us that, that, you know, us as students in this program, we get immersed into, you know, clinicals right off the bat and we graduate earlier. Um, it, it just looks so good for us as students applying. Um, I can say myself, I've, I accepted a job already. Most, the majority of my classmates have already accepted jobs, um, even just over the last couple of months. So, you know, again, Shane mentioned that, um, you know, this, this field is thriving and it's just getting bigger and bigger. And it is true. I mean, there are just so many um, job openings and, and people that are looking for new hires. So um, it's just all around, it's, it's been such a great experience. Um, and, you know, I'll be sad to, to be done with the program, but, but happy in May when it's uh, time to start practicing. So um, with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Logan. Thank you so much, Chris, um, yeah, no, for sharing your you. insights. Um, I'm sure our students really appreciated that. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Cassandra, who's gonna tell us a little bit about the admissions requirements um, and relating it back to her story and sharing it with you as well. Yes, thank you, Logan. So um, some of the requirements needed for admissions are a bachelor's degree from an accredited college or university, I personally had a bachelor's of science in biology. And then I went ahead and I got my master's of science in cell and molecular biology. Um, and then I also had some research experience. So I feel like all of this um, academic and research experience really helped me excel in the didactic and clinical portions of this program. Um, in addition, there are some prerequisite courses, which I'll expand on the next slide. Uh, there's an admissions test, and there's also a CASPER test. So some of the prerequisites that are needed um, in order to apply to the program are a year of biology with lab, a year of chemistry with lab, a year of organic chemistry with lab, a year of physics with lab, one semester of biochem, one semester of calculus, a semester of advanced statistics, a semester of English with expository, one semester of human anatomy with lab, and then one semester of human physiology. I can honestly say that um, personally, I've found an appreciation for anatomy and physiology. As anesthesiology assistants, it's important that we understand the anatomy and physiology of disease states so we can anticipate how this will affect our anesthetic management of patients. So it's important um, when applying into the program to have a pretty good understanding of um, these prereqs um, because once you go in, like uh, Chris was saying earlier, you kind of go um, head in and you know you guys 
receive a lot of information. So having a good background on all these prereqs is very important in order for you to have um, a successful experience throughout this program. Awesome, thank you so much, Cassandra. I'm gonna turn it over to Shane, um, who's gonna break down the student averages for us. Great, thanks everybody. So um, our student body, uh, you know, the, the pretty strong variety of uh, experiences that everybody has. And we really strongly in our core believe in this holistic approach that we use for our admission cycles. So we do look at the GPA, it's a very important number. We do look at the standardized exams like the MCAT and the GRE and the DAT. And we do heavily look at the science curriculum. What we found is that these um, data points, if you will, they're just indicators. They're not uh, outcomes, right? And so we look at the other pieces of the individual's application, such as you know, research experience, having another degree, um, working in other fields, um, having bench work, right? Having volunteer work, having international work. All of these things come into play when we look at an applicant. In addition, we have an interview. Uh, it's a really important part of this. And we look at the affective domain, right? How do people interact? How do people understand? How do they answer questions? Um, and we kind of compile all these together to look at what we think would be a successful um, student in our curriculum. Like I said before, we have far more um, qualified applicants than we have um, space for. Nonetheless, we uh, do our best to get everybody in, in, in the fit. So the overall GPA is about 3.5, quite a broad range though. You can see 2.9 to 4. The prereqs, once again, the same data. And the MCAT varies from the low 490s to 518. So these are all great, very competitive scores. And these are, many of these students are students who are choosing not to go to medical school for whatever reason. Perhaps they're looking at the landscape of healthcare and recognizing perhaps this isn't for them. They're looking at the structure of medical schools and the expense and the debt that's incurred along the way. They're just looking for other opportunities and how it might um, fit their own life and their own arc of their professional career. And so we find that these uh, variety of interests that the students come with and applicants fit in well with our, uh, our own paradigm. If you look a little bit deeper into the student body as a whole, very much, yes, we do parallel quite a bit of what the um, medical student, uh, typical applicant student body looks like. So about half of our students do have a, a biological science background. Um, we do have quite a few and some of the other ones though. So the neurosciences, psych, biochemistry, um, kinesiology, you, you name it, there's quite a broad background there. Um, but we have a quite a, a um, direct breakdown for our gender, We're pretty consistent here. It's about 50-50 uh, mix, which is a great mix to have. Um, in addition, our cohort average age is about 25. So we do have some people that are coming straight from undergrad that are doing fantastic. I just had a meeting with one of them this evening. She's one of the top third in the class right now. She's doing amazing. We also have people who are older and have had other careers and other jobs, and they're also doing quite well also. So quite a broad range in our age breakdown, if you will. Um, with that, um, Logan, did you want to hit some of the application deadlines? Yeah, I will take over. Um, so each year our application is available in March. Um, so you can start filling out the application and our first deadline that you want to look for is October 1. Um, in between October 1 is our early decision deadline and then our regular decision deadlines, February 1, <clears throat> excuse me, in between those two, um, dates, we have um, rolling admissions. So um, September to March, we will um, pull your application to interv interview you. Um, this year, unfortunately, we can't have you on campus. We would love to, but um, for your safety, we're doing virtual interviews. Um, so we're doing that through Zoom. But typically, any um, in a normal year, we would have you on campus. Um, that way, we can get to know you, and you can get to know the faculty and staff and the program directors too to make sure it's a good fit on both ends. Um, after that February one deadline, um, you have you'll get the admissions notification from our admissions director um, about your enrollment decision. And classes will begin end of May. Um, so that's kind of a brief overview of the timeline of the application cycle each year. Um, and that is what we have for you um, today. We're gonna jump into some Q&A um, right now. Great, but Logan. And I think what I'll do is I'll hit on a couple of points that have been some themes in the, uh, the Q&A, if that's okay. Sure, yeah, go for it. 
Sure, a couple of themes that we've picked up in the Q&A are related to the prereqs. And this is a consistent question as uh, with COVID, many of the coursework now uh, that people are undergoing is uh, at a distance or live or remote or asynchronous. And so are the labs. So our preference has always been that these core courses, there's three core courses, there's the anatomy, physiology, and the biochemistry. We really encourage folks to take those in person if possible. Now, if their timeline is such that they're taking it now or they're taking it next semester, well, clearly it's going to be continued remote, right? And so we will accept those. We prefer them to be um, live and in person, though. We find that to be the best mechanism that um, fits for the learning that we expect in, their, in our classrooms. Um, so if that's possible to have those classes taken next summer or next fall, please do that. But if your timeline is right now and that's all you have as an option, you know, clearly you have to register for those classes. We ask that you inquire with our uh, admissions um, director, Dr. Jennifer Pewen, and ask her to say, hey, these are the classes I'm taking. Just want to double check that these are going to fit the requirements, even though they're virtual. So that's one thing I wanted to bring up. The other thing I wanted to bring up was the uh, standardized exams. Some questions kind of coming into those quite a bit. So our standardized exams are the MCAT. That's the preferred one. Um, and we asked for a timeline for that one for about three years uh, by matriculation. The other one we have is the GRE. And we asked for that for about five years before matriculation. The reason for these standardized exams, if I can, in order to practice, we must sit for a certifying examination. A certified examination is a standardized examination. It's really important for um, either one of those that people are to demonstrate to themselves how they're going to perform on the standardized exam. I know a lot of people have some challenges to say, look, I'm just not a good test taker. I understand, but it would be a travesty for you to go through a curriculum and then make it all the way through and then not be able to pass a certifying examination, right? So it's very important that people are able to meet these benchmarks. We're doing it for our student body so they get familiar and comfortable and better at, at taking those examinations. So uh, there's, there's the reasoning behind those. Another thing is that they're, they're pretty good indicators. They do demonstrate over the course of time whether someone's gonna be uh, successful in our curriculum. So the more uh, and the higher people perform in those standardized exams, typically the better they do in our curriculum. Not always by any measure but there's a tendency for sure. So those are the um, timelines we have for those two exams and the reasoning behind them. So the, a little bit on the prereqs, a little bit on the center of the exams. And then Logan, what, do you, what should we hit on next? Yeah, so we did have a question about shadowing and how it's been um, extremely difficult during the pandemic. Um, what steps might you recommend taking to prove our interest in this career outside of shadowing? Um, so I'll hit that one as one just because I do get a lot of these questions um, for our current applicant cycle. Uh, and this goes along with some of the other ideas were brought out there, which uh, are um, sort of um, remote shadowing, if you will. Um, some people are doing that, and I think that's totally fine. Um, different um, healthcare professional organizations have those out there. Um, the other thing, though, that's out there quite a bit is scribing. And so, yes, scribing is a fantastic way um, to participate in shadowing, if you will. Um, people are doing that remotely in some instances, um, and so that's a great way to do that. Now, this year, shadowing is not a requirement for um, the uh, application and the acceptance. We found that the shadowing is a great opportunity for people to have, but um, it's not any requirement. As we look back at our graduates and our students and we say, you know, hey, did, did you find that to be a, a vital thing? And the answer pretty consistently is no. That being said, we do have virtual shadowing. So if somebody is applying this year and they're a competitive applicant, we are going to, um, if they're interested, we would set them up to shadow virtually one of our core faculty. So they would have a discussion with them for the day, talk about the clinical day, talk about what they did, what they didn't do, some of the examples of the anesthetics they had, and spend some time kind of diving into the profession and what their experience was clinically. So those are some options that people have for shadowing. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, another question. Um is um, pertaining to the two years while you're in school, um, how does time off work? Say that you have um, a family engagement or um, something that you have to attend that you might not be able, that you need some time off. Um, how does that work? Uh, great question. So um, the, uh, look, I'm gonna step back. Uh, life events are vital. I think we all think it's very important that people can participate in these life events, whether it be a wedding, whether it be a christening, whether it be, whatever the event about mitzvah, people need to participate in these events. We really want to make sure that those things are honored. 
At the same time, if those events unfortunately conflict with a major exam, right? Certain exams we can't change, they're kind of locked in. These are standardized exams coming from the governing bodies, if you will. They're gonna be what they are. Um, but people know well in advance of time what those times and dates are. Um, we routinely will work with students on some of these things, especially with the live events and well planned ahead of time. Awesome, thank you very much. Um, I'm looking, some of these questions are very um, specific to your story, which is awesome, but I, um, that might be a good thing to ask um, uh, and email us um, so we can answer your question. I'm just looking for a couple um, that, that we're getting that would pertain to everybody. Um, I know one of them that's being asked is um, a lot of the, because of COVID and everything, a lot of the classes either have like online labs. Um, so I don't know if um, you guys are going to be accepting online labs or do they have to be in-person labs for a lot of the prerequisites? Yeah, so we're definitely um, accepting those this this year. Um, pretty consistent across the healthcare um, education spectrum. So we prefer them not to be, but at this point, that's all there really is, and we completely understand that that's what it is. So if it's possible to people defer that to later on, great. But if their timeline is such they're graduating, they need to take courses now, or they're applying now, then absolutely we do accept those. We ask though that they reach out to Dr. Jennifer Pugh just to inform her and say, hey, this is the course I'm taking. It, it meets, right? Because there may be an inconsistency there. We want to make sure that you get choose the right class at your academic institution. Great. And there were a couple of questions about the virtual shadowing. Um, I know at um, we did in, um, install a program um, at in place of our um, shadowing, um, if you contact us um, at our email, and we can um, definitely um, set you up with a practicing CAA, you can talk to them on the phone. I don't know, Shane, if you have um, a contact for the virtual shadowing, or maybe that's something that you call a hospital and see if they're doing it that way. You want to contact the program first. Um, if you're applying the cycle, um, that's the only real people we're going to be able to help with that one. If, for people applying next cycle, there'll probably be other options. So you're applying the cycle and you've applied, then we can kind of go through, um, you know, talking to you about what those virtual shadowings might look like. And so you want to contact each program, that, or particular program you're applying to first. So if it's Cleveland, you contact them. If it's Houston, you contact them, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, and then quick question about the prereqs. Um, is there a certain time frame that you have to complete your prereqs before you apply? No, you do not need to complete the prereqs before you apply. That's interesting. It's a, it's a common misnomer. So um, as long as the prereqs are completed before matriculation, that's what mat matters. So we routinely accept people conditional upon completing these last couple courses um, with, you know, grad, you know, completing these courses with a grade that is determined. It might be a minimum B, it might be minimum A, whatever the determination is for that particular applicant, that'll be the conditions for the acceptance. And so that's pretty common, very common for that to happen. Great, and then this one um, is a great question for our students. Um, Chris or Cassandra, who have, um, both of you can also answer. Um, are you able to share any experience or tips about the interview process? Um, Chris, I'll turn to you for this one. Yeah, um, you know, I think all the programs from what I've heard, uh, whether it be Washington, Cleveland, or Houston, every applicant that I've talked to, and in, including in my own experience, um, the interview process here is actually, it's, it's a really good, efficient process, if that makes sense. I, I just, what I mean is you feel very comfortable um, going into these interviews. You know, everybody that you interview with, most of the time it's, you know, five or six people. You, you feel more like you're having a conversation um, with everybody. And again, I've heard that across all programs. It's, it's nothing where you come in and you get grilled um, and you don't, know how to come up with an answer for a question. It, it's not like that. It's um, just come in and, and be yourself because that's, that's all this program is looking for. You know, if we're bring if they're bringing you in for an interview, you obviously have the marks um, that they're looking for, um, whether it be with GPA or uh, test scores or anything like that. The, the interview process, they just want to get to know you, um, have a conversation with you. So my best advice is, you know, 
relax and try not to be as nervous. I know that's easier said than done, but um, just go in um, with the attitude that you're, you're there to kind of sell yourself. And, um, you know, again, it, it's just like having a conversation back and forth um, with your interviewer. It's very, I don't want to say laid back. It's, it's just, Cassandra, I don't know if, if you could think of a better way of explaining it. It's, um, just more conversational, I guess. Great, thank you. Um, and Sandra, if you have anything to add as well um, in your experience interviewing um, with Houston as well. Yeah, um, yeah, Chris, I think it was more conversational. Um, there were certain interviewers who had your typical like interview questions, you know. Um, I think to try to get to know um, your character. And um, that's kind of like what the Casper test does. Um, it's more like um, trying to see if you're adequate for the profession. Um, but overall, like my experience interviewing was really good. I had, we had uh, two chiefs that um, we interviewed with as well. And they were students at the time. So they were able to provide like really good insight over like how the interview process would be. and you know, um, which inner, which interviewers were going to be a little tougher and, you know, but overall, like it wasn't anything, um, out of the ordinary or, um, like anything negative. Um, I walked out of there feeling pretty positive about my interview. And I think everyone who interviewed with me felt the same way. Um, all of us felt, had like a pretty positive experience with all the interviewers. And um, yeah, if you are interested though, um, and you maybe have like some pre-interview jitters or something like that, I can also suggest like you can go online. I know many of you guys are maybe coming um, straight out of undergrad and don't really have any experience interviewing. So it always helps to like, um, go online and just look up like interview questions and how to properly interview because there are um, ways to properly interview. Um, and then like most of us as second years, um, like Chris was saying, we already have jobs. Um, so knowing how to interview for the program is important because in a year you will be interviewing for a job as well. Um, so yeah, my tip would be go online and you can look up some interview questions and overall like um what makes a good um interviewee great thank you very much um shane this one is for you um we have a few people asking about um the practice expanding into other states and if there is a certain rate um or any insight that you have to share um on that question Sure, of course. Yeah, um, you know, I go back to that old um, uh, uh, cartoon, and I'm just a bill sitting on Capitol Hill, right? Um, one never knows when a bill is going to become a law. Um, you never know. Um, I do know this, though. There is a significant shortage, and there continues to be a shortage as time goes by. The, I've been doing this for almost 25 years, and um, the shortages only seem to get bigger and bigger every single year. Um, with that, um, in my role uh, the, within AAAP, there is a continued interest from other deans, from schools of medicine and other states to um, open up programs, whether in states that are currently practice states or states that are not practice states. So there's keen interest to help um, meet the needs of their communities. Um, when it might happen, who knows? Um, it's an ebb and flow process. And um, uh, you know, we've had bills that took a year. We've had bills that have taken seven years and some that have taken longer than that. So um, it's a big question mark there. All right. Um, another question about clinical rotations. Um, someone asked if they are completed near the schools um, or near the locations, or if you have like an option to travel outside of um, your designated site. Um, Shane, I can turn this one back to you as well. Repeat that, I apologize. That's okay. Um, clinical rotations, um, if they are completed near the site of your choosing, or if you get to travel outside to a different state 
Um, how does that work? Gotcha. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, so um, typically the um, elective rotations are blended throughout the senior rotation cycle. Um, and the students have an opportunity, depending upon the site, between three to five options for external rotations. Um, these are options the students select. These are not ones that we have the students take. They're more than welcome to take those elective rotations in the region that they were already in. So for example, if they're in Houston, they would take them to Memorial Hermann or they would take it to other local hospitals in the area. Um, but if let's say they were in Cleveland and they're like, you know, I'm really interested to do a rotation in Missouri. Um, you know, I've got an aunt there and I can stay there for free. And I hear that's a great educational experience. I would love to go there. Um, and so those are opportunities that people might do. Now for our mandatory rotations, we do have some mandatory rotations and these would be things like the cardiac and traumas and so forth. We do have a handful of those that may be out of site that may be in locations away from the primary sites. Those are typically options, not really mandatory for the students to attend those. Um, at that site, right? So my a student might say, yeah, actually I'm interested in doing a specific rotation in a specialty in Cincinnati. And so well, great, well, we have a cardiac opportunity there. Let's see what we can do about getting an opportunity set up for you. In those situations, the university and the program do um, provide a sponsorship for housing, a stipend, if you will, that's more than adequate, or in many clinical sites we're finding, especially with the elective rotations, the clinical sites are um, have developed their own housing as a recruitment mechanism to get students to come and rotate with them and um, not worry about housing and to get them to learn there and hopefully in the future hire them. Thank you. Um, and just one more question that we have time for. Um, are there program, maybe this wouldn't pertain to this year, um, but in the past years, um, are there program events outside of didactic and clinical learning where students are invited to get to meet and greet each other? Um, so I think they're asking if all uh, if there's an opportunity for all of the sites to come together, if there's any events or things like that. Sure, of course. Yeah. So we have a very long history um, of our participation in um, our profession. And that starts with our professional organization, which is the Quad A, um, the American Academy of Anesthesiology Assistants. There's an annual meeting that um, all the students uh, go to, not in COVID clearly, uh, but uh, all the students go to, and we provide a stipend for travel and for accommodation to this meeting, we pay for registration as well. As the students go to this, it's about a five day conference. It's, it moves around each year. It's a different site and different location. Um, in addition, um, depending upon where this meeting is taking place and what position the student might have, whether it's in class leadership, for the class leadership, typically those folks will participate in the American Society of Anesthesiologists annual meeting. Once again, that moves around the country. Um, and then of course there are regional meetings. So um, in Ohio, there's the Ohio Society of Anesthesiologists meeting typically takes place in Columbus. Uh, in Texas, there's the Texas Society which usually takes place outside of Austin. And in DC, well, it takes place in DC. So um, those meetings would be held and participated by the local students in each of those programs. Thank you. Um, so we hit that six o'clock mark. Um, so we're going to wrap up here. I just want to show, um, just want to share with you, if you want to learn more, you can go um, visit our website. Um, we have a blog on there that highlights some students um, questions that you may have. Um, you can find on there um, as well. It may answer your questions, but if not, um, and we didn't get to your questions, I'm so sorry, um, but you can actually email us at msaprogram at case.edu. Um, we will, there's a few people in that inbox and we will get back to you as quick as we can, but we definitely encourage you to reach out to us. Um, and you can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, where you can learn about events coming up um, and reminders for deadlines and things like that. But that is all we have for you tonight. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we hope you have a great evening.